We're going to talk a little bit about differential diagnosis, and I think the beauty of the 10-minute talk is it gets us away from the old days in the med school when we were sitting at, at least for me, Miling Hall or wherever you went to school, and sat there for hour upon hour. So the 10 minutes are quick hitters, but it's also a challenge to make sure we get something out of that 10 minutes. So we'll try and hit some pearls that are relative to um, your thought process for quickly evaluating spine patients and if it's a spine etiology versus a lot of the things that we're going to talk about later today, which is obviously more related to shoulder and hip. So differential diagnosis, although this is kind of the upper extremity part of things, this, what I'm going to talk about today really applies to both the cervical and lumbar spine. So whether you have a cervical or a lumbar issue, differential diagnosis is very important in our practice because we have a lot of patients that go back and forth between either the neck doctor or the shoulder doctor, and certainly between the lumbar doctor and the hip doctor. So there's a lot of interplay here. And what we're going to talk about today really applies to both the cervical with its relation to the shoulder and also the lumbar with its relation to the hip. So the first part I'll say is mainly periscapular and buttock pain are usually of a spine etiology. Anterior pain, groin or otherwise, is oftentimes either hip or shoulder pathology. So that's one just general rule where a lot of times people come in complaining of what they determine is their back or their hip, and you kind of have to get a feel for that. And the same thing with the shoulder. So we'll talk a little bit about those things here today. So the main thing, so the first pearl is, is that crossover. The second one is, as far as spine things, sprains and strains don't last for weeks and months. So if somebody has a sprain or a strain, and it's been going on for months and months and months, it's rarely a sprain. If you have a sprained hamstring and you rest it, it usually doesn't last for months and months and months. So in the spine, you can kind of eliminate muscular issues if they've lasted for several months. And then you start looking at the main culprits. Disc injury, facet injury, which are the little joints in the back of the, the three-joint complex, disc herniations, and stenosis. So that's, that's going to cover the vast majority of spine problems. So if you quickly go through that list in your mind, you're able to eliminate a lot of those things. So if we look here, the disc itself serves as the pivot point. So this gets most of the load. The majority of the load, about 80 plus percent, goes through the anterior column of the spine. So that gets transmitted to the disc. The disc obviously is, in our mind, is thought of as the shock absorber. Um, it's under compression and tension at different times, also tor torsion stresses. So the disc is very susceptible to injury. The two major components of the disc, as we recall, the nucleus is in the center. Obviously, the annulus is the outer part. So this material here, a lot of patients think it's a liquid or a gel. I think of it as crab meat. It's a spongy, fibrous tissue that serves, serves as a shock absorber. It's obviously susceptible to injury. So if we talk about that, over the course of time, people can have degeneration of the disc. And this happens by a couple of means. Firstly, the nucleus over time is not as well contained. And we'll see that on an MRI when you start to lose fluid or lose hydration of the disc. You start to see the fibers of the annulus break down. And with this, you have the disc essentially losing height and increasing its, its uh, span and width and out, oftentimes bulging into the neural canal. So if we look, I love this. Doug will talk more about these kind of things, but uh, Dr. Reeder, obviously one of our radiologists, but this is one of my old favorites. This is from, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, something like that. But I love how the difference between looking at this disc and this disc, and you can see here, fairly well contained nucleus, good hydration. Here you've lost that. It's also called black disc disease at one time years ago. And now you're having forces transmitted into the vertebral body, and that's what you're starting to see here. So this is a good, good example, even from a very old MRI scan, from a fairly normal disc to a significant pain generator, which could present with either hip or shoulder pain. Obviously, here's a lumbar MRI, but um, those kind of things are, are very common that we see. The other thing that's commonly missed by a lot of people is facet injury. Everybody talks about a slip disc. Every patient comes in and has what your other guy had and the guy before him, and everybody has a slip disc. It's very rare that a patient comes in and talks to you about a facet problem. But a lot of times, with their unilaterality and those kind of things, this often crosses over into both the, the hip and the shoulder realm. So the facet joint is simply the joint in the back. I've heard them referred to as the knuckles of the spine, and that kind of makes sense. The disc is up here. That's the pivot point. But in order for you to have a pivot, you have to have articulations in the posterior column, and that's the facets. And you have one on the left and one on the right at each level. So those are the posterior aspects of the three-joint complex. If we look at a facet joint injury, this diagram shows pretty nicely. The same arthritic processes that can occur, shoulder, elbow, wrist, et cetera, can occur in these little, little facet joints. They're an articulated joint. They have a synovial lining. They have a normal articulating surface like any other joint in your body. 
Over time, they can obviously become arthritic. As they become arthritic, you can have pain, in this case, from arthritis of the joint itself. You can also have foraminal stenosis or foraminal impingement in both the cervical or the lumbar spine from facet arthropathy or facet arthritis. So that's what you see here. So treatment for both of these things, usually for the spine world, is conservative. We try and nicely ignore people initially. Once, and that's what you do. Anti-inflammatories, try a medrol dose pack, kind of let Mother Nature take care of it. When it doesn't, then you start talking about things like injections. And in this case, you can do facet injections and RFNs, and we have some other people that will talk more about those things. So <clears throat> that's the facet. So the facet can give you either axial pain from arthritis, or it can give you foraminal stenosis type symptoms from impingement of the nerve root. When we talk about disc herniations, everybody has, and, and this uh, every day, do I have a disc bulge or a herniation? Do I have a slip disc? Or, and the answer is yes. So this is, this is a good way to think of it. And in, in my mind, this is the way I always try and think of it, it's simplest terms possible for patients to describe this. Nuclear disruption is kind of what we saw in the MRI scan, right? The nucleus is not contained, but there's really no impingement kind of thing as far as pinching back on the neural elements. This is what we would call degenerative disc disease. And you can talk about different terminology, but essentially the disc is showing wear. The shock absorber is wearing out. You can have a protruded disc where now you're starting to have a protrusion or part of the disc actually impinging or pushing on a nerve. You can have an extruded fragment where part of the annulus comes out and you can have a sequestered fragment where part of, the annual, or part of the nucleus comes out and actually leaves its attachment to the annulus. So this is a good guide. I just like this slide because it puts it in a nice framework. It's very simple. It's easy for patients to understand this. It's easy for other physicians to understand this. There's a lot of different ways to talk about disc herniations, but I find this to be pretty simple. So herniated disc, you can see here, it's another nice old MRI, but you can see the nerve root directly draped over the over the disc itself. The classic finding for this is in, in the neck, obviously, is arm pain. In the back, it's obviously leg pain. But a lot of these people come in and have significant pain in their buttocks, significant pain in their periscapular region, and oftentimes the, 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 the cause can be a herniated disc. Similar idea. The first treatment is nothing. Second treatment is injections, and then obviously surgical intervention for people who have unremitting radicular pain. So <clears throat> this is just another one. And Doug, this is a lead-in for you. This is an old patient that in the years gone by, you'd do a myelogram, and this would be normal. Here you can see a disc herniation. So here's somebody who would have a normal myelogram, who obviously on exam would probably have a foraminal irritation of the nerve root. And that's just an example of foraminal stenosis area. So quick hitter, only 10 minutes, but really the take-home points are this. Periscapular and buttock pain are kind of a crossover area between either the neck and shoulder or the low back and the hip. And then the major things that can cause injury as far as a long-term injury are disc injuries, facet injuries. Those are the main two structures that you're talking about, and they can be due to either causing herniated discs or uh, stenosis. So thank you.